So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the second webinar in our KET series, the virtual learning series of webinars. Um, and I'm happy to be here to present to you. I am Lynn Schaefer, and I am an education consultant at KET. And for anyone who may not know, um, every public school in Kentucky has an education consultant, and we each cover our own part of the state. I'll be giving you some links and contact information so that if um, you are in a different district than mine, mine is the northeast portion of Kentucky, you can easily contact your own consultant because we are here to help teachers and students. That's what we do. It's what we love to do. So today I'm going to talk to you about PBS learning media. And uh, if you don't know what that is, you'll have a better sense of it after today. Um, I'm going to give you a short overview of that, and then I'm going to focus on some middle school and high school resources in several of the main subject areas. And so my title is It's Lit, which I thought was cool until my teenage daughter said, no, that was so last year. <laughs> but I thought, well, it doesn't matter because I'm going to talk to you about some literature resources and other English language arts resources and also science, math and history. Um, if you have an interest in other subject areas, I'll be giving you a way to find out some more about those. Um, the best way really is to just go into PBS Learning Media and look around, um, but I'm gonna give you some tips today. Oh, before I forget, I probably should make sure that you we do the housekeeping, which is muting your microphone, if you would, please. And then if you have questions, please do ask and use the chat box for that. Um, I believe when I'm sharing my screen this way that I cannot see your chat uh, comments, but I have some of my colleagues here today who will help me out and make sure that we get those questions answered. Certificates will be provided um, after, or at the end of the session. You'll actually do a short survey for us. And when you complete that survey, uh, you will be given a link. Um, or actually, yes, you'll be given a link and you'll get that within, I think, 24 hours after you complete the survey. Okay, so let's get started. So a little bit about PBS Learning Media, because I know not everyone knows, so maybe you've heard the name, but you don't know the specifics. Um, so what can you do with learning media? You can, as a teacher, uh, create lessons and quizzes. You can help students with research. Um, I've actually taught um, workshops with students on how to do research in learning media, and it's safe, it's reliable. Do not have to worry about pop-ups, questionable ads, and questionable content. Um, you can also share resources really easily. So whether it's an individual resource like a video, or let's say that you have some favorites and you want to put them in a folder, which you can do, you can share that folder with anyone, and they don't even have to have um, an account in Learning Media to be able to see those resources. Um, also, you can engage your students because the resources in learning media are multimedia. They're meant to uh, be interesting to their target audiences. Um, also, I wanted to say I'm focusing today on certain subject areas. And obviously, we don't have time to do as thorough a job as I would like to. But what I have created, let me show you here. You will also get a link to this presentation. And one of the things that you'll have access to is this folder that I created for you in Learning Media. So you can see here, um, I started with tips for distance learning with PBS Learning Media. So for those of you who've never used it before, you can watch, I believe that's an hour long PD that PBS did uh, back in the spring. And then, Pretty much in the order that I'm going to cover some of these resources, I put them in order in this folder. And then you can see the rest, there's four pages worth of resources that, um, that I've given you here. All right, bear with me here. There we go. It pops down a little screen and then I can't see, I have to wait for it to go away. Okay. 
Um, so learning media, as I said, is uh, multimedia resources. Uh, these are aligned to the state and educational uh, educational standards. I think I said that twice, state and national educational standards. Uh, it includes all grade levels. It also includes professional development that you can complete um, on your own time. And also most of the resources in here um, have support materials with them. So some may have discussion questions or uh, activities, teaching tips, background essays for the teacher, uh, and some will have all of these things. Um, I should also say that learning media is integrated with Google Classroom, um, and there are tons of quality resources for people that you trust, like KET, like a PBS, NASA, and lots of others, all free and very user friendly. Um, so I said at the beginning that I would be offering some resources in other subject areas. And so the way to do that, but save a little time today, I've linked you out here to the PBS Learning Media Collections document that my colleagues and I put together and we try to update regularly. I'll just let me quickly show that to you so you'll see. Okay, so this is the um, collections document. So within learning media, there are all these individual resources and many of them are part of a, a larger collection on the same subject area. And so if a uh, teacher asked us, you know, how will I know if there are collections unless I just go and look and look. And so we thought, let's, let's make a, um, a document for that. So we did. And so what you have here, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a list of many of our favorites, most popular resources. Um, it's arranged alphabetically. So you can see we start with our, the arts. We have some wonderful arts toolkits, dance, drama, music, and visual arts, um, and so forth. And then we keep scrolling. We've got cross-curricular resources, uh, English language arts and literacy, and so on. You'll notice too um, that what is listed is the name of the collection. Then it will tell you the grade levels that this is most appropriate for. Sometimes you could go up or down one or two grade levels and be just fine though. But this is a suggestion. And then there's a link and all you have to do is click that link. It'll take you straight to learning media. Okay. Now you don't have to have an account or be logged in to learning media to use it. You can go straight in and do and research for, for the materials, the resources. Uh, it's to your advantage though to sign up. It's free, it takes about a minute. Um, and then you have access to all of the functionality and the tools. Let me see if I can get back here. There we go. Um, so learning media is for teachers and for students. And so I'm not gonna take you into the student um, part today, since the focus of this is uh, not on specifics of learning media. However, I wanted you to see, uh, this is currently what the learning media for students page looks like. Um, once students sign in, then all of their assignments and projects and, and, and resources that they have liked or favorited will be there in one spot. Um, so they can search in the search box just as you would search in the search box for resources. Um, up here, I believe um, it's covered up for me right now, but up in this area, there is a place to enter a code. That is not a code to have access to learning media. What that is, is simply when you create an assignment, like even just assigning a video, um, learning media has a code and then so if you go into class that day and you say i want you all to watch this video type this code in and you write it on the board it's a usually a noun and a number then they can go straight to that without having to search it saves time um, and so that's what the code box is for by the way i should say um the look here um i, I think it's a a beautiful page it's very colorful um some older students might wonder though if they see it is this just for younger students and it is not it is for um, all the way through uh, high school and beyond including pd um, it's just very colorful page 
And then just a tip that I like to throw out there. If you as a, as a teacher or presenter want to look at the student view, to get back to your view, all you have to do is scroll down to the bottom of the page and click on teacher view. Take you straight back. I just wanted to throw that out as a time saver for you. Okay, so um, to my presentation today is going to really take you through some resources using our brand new uh, fresh off the presses um, framework. And so um, what our framework is, is basically how to take these resources and use them, utilize them, uh, use the content in your classes. So it's a suggestion, it's specific ways for you to, to use the materials. Um, so instead of just saying, here are some materials, we like to go a little further and, to, and be as helpful as we can. And so the framework you will see here um, includes access, uh, introduce, apply, assess, and connect. And you can read the full framework uh, with this link if you would like to. Uh, I'm not gonna take you there just because I think it'll become clear as we go on and I, and I use some examples for you. So the first step is to access uh, the content. And so one way to access PBS Learning Media is to go to our KET education page, which you can see at the bottom uh, of the slide there, it's ket.org slash education. And then once you're on our education page, there's a link at the top. I believe there's one also at the bottom. Um, there may be one on the side. I'm not sure about that though. Uh, there used to be. But you can click PBS Learning Media at the top and it will take you straight into learning media. By the way, there is also uh, there at the top, it says about KET education and it says contact. If you click contact, you will be taken um, to a page that gives a summary of what KET's education consultants like myself do, what we, we can do for you, and it will have a map of the state and show you who your particular consultant is so that you can reach us easily. All right, so let's get into the content. Um, full disclosure. I used to be uh, a college English instructor, and uh, I come from a line of English instructors, so I guess it's, it's in my blood. So I have to start with the English language arts, specifically the literature. Um, so you've accessed the materials, you're in learning media, and you, let's say that you want to introduce this idea, this concept, to your class uh, for a literature unit. And so the questions that you're going to present to your class include, what is an unreliable narrator? And why would a writer want to use one of these unreliable narrators in a literary work? Good question. Sometimes I like to throw, I would throw those out to your students and see what they say before they've even read anything yet. So then a way to introduce this idea after they maybe thought about it and talked about it some, um, one of the resources that will work really well comes from a collection called It's Lit, which I used in my uh, webinar title. Um, <clears throat> in this collection, there are several videos on really interesting, relevant topics to the study of literature. And one of them happens to be uh, Unreliable Narrator. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll see that this video is about seven and a half minutes long. I am not going to play it. Play the whole seven and a half minutes. Um, I'm going to play a few pieces of it. And the reason I want to take time just on this one video to, to do that, I just want to see you how thorough these videos are. These actually don't have support materials for the, the It's Lit collection. KET did not create this collection. Um, but the content of the video is so thorough that I think that you could just pull some things from that um, and, and really you don't, you're not as reliant on the support materials as you might otherwise be. And I'll give you some examples of that too. So I'm going to take you into this video 
show you a few select parts. Um, and this is the only video that I'll do this for. I'll, I'm going to skip it along just to give you a sense of the coverage of this particular series. Okay, let me start it. By the way, before I click uh, begin on the video, I want you to notice that it tells you what type of resource you have. Learning Media has videos. It also has documents, interactives, which you'll see some today, which means the student manipulates something. Some, some of the younger ones, especially for the younger students, are, are like games, um, uh, grades 9 through 12, and then the collection. Notice there's a link, so if you wanted to go explore the, the full collection, you could do that. We can favorite this item, which I have already done. So the heart is uh, colored in. That means I have favorited it. I like it, and I want it to be put in my list of favorites. I can assign it to students, or I can share it. Or if I'm using Google Classroom, there's the button there to share straight into that. Also, some suggestions other videos you may want, and the standards. So the educational standards are there so that you can see um, what standards this particular resource might be helping you um, to teach to. All right, so let's start. This is really handy where it gives you the number so that you can, if you don't want to show the whole video and you didn't have time to edit it <laughs> as, I, as I wish I had, yeah, let's see. This should be it. The first half of Gone Girl has us choosing sides between the alternating accounts of a missing woman and her accused husband, while the second half, well, basically confirms the fact that we can't trust anyone and marriage is a bad idea. All of these narrators assume that they're successfully manipulating the audience the same way they manipulate everyone else, but the authors are counting on their readers to have a more sophisticated moral compass. Other narrators are more unintentionally unreliable. In The Telltale Heart, Poe's narrator is since... Okay. So everybody can hear that okay? And if you wouldn't care to mute your microphones, just a reminder. Okay, just a second. Just a little more here. What I like that I'm going to let you see here about, the, about these videos are the questions and the deeper issues that, that they address, which is the kind of thing I would want to see in support material. So let me play just a smidge more. Okay, and please do make sure your microphone is muted. Thank you. about taking stories at face value. But there's an even deeper fear than that. Perhaps we are our own unreliable narrator. Psychologists often divide human consciousness into two selves, the experiencing self and the narrating self. The experiencing self feels sensations and emotions, happiness, fear, pain, pleasure, and the narrating self spins all of this input into a story to make sense of it all. I feel pain in my belly, says the experiencing self, well, that's because you skipped lunch, says the narrating self. So let's have a snack. Ah, that feels better, says the experiencing self. See, I told you so, says the narrating self. We tend to accept our narrating self as plain reality, but narrating self is just a storyteller like any other, susceptible to fallacies, emotions, and prejudices and biases. We often tell ourselves what we want to hear, conveniently omitting facts that make us uncomfortable. And in the age of social media, we're not just narrating our stories to ourselves, we're telling them to the world. Are we narrating life as it actually is, or are we skewing our stories, editing and cropping our best, most idyllic photos while deleting unflattering ones, choosing to post about our good days, but not our bad days? Are we hashtag blessed or hashtag grateful when we're hashtag really not at all? Unreliable narrators remind us that we are fallible and that other people can have vastly different perspectives. They help us understand why we believe the things that we do or push us to change those beliefs altogether. They encourage the reader to see the world through multiple lenses. So maybe the most powerful character in literature is not actually the narrator. Maybe it's you, the reader, trained with a critical eye, an open mind, and an armful of good books. Okay. 
And I will say uh, the parts I left out are really good. They give lots of great examples, including from Shakespeare, as well as popular culture uh, books that have been made into films like uh, Gone Girl. All right. And so on. Now, so we've we've introduced this idea and we've used a, a learning media resource. And then here's how we can use the framework to continue uh, teaching with it. Okay, so apply. So there's a lot of ways you could apply, um, have the students apply what they're learning. So you could provide them with the terms that are used in the video. And so some of them would be like omniscient narrator, unreliable narrator, um, unintentional, un, uh, un, un, uh, unintentional, unreliable narrator, or what she calls an innocent narrator, um, and so forth. You could give them the terms and then you can let the students work to create a glossary. So based on what they've seen and maybe what else you discussed, uh, how would they define those terms? What do those terms mean? Um, you could even do something fun like use Google Forms maybe to have students um, vote on the definitions that they felt were were the best that the students created. So if you wanted, you could do individual or you could do groups, but the ones that the students felt were the, were the best uh, definitions would then become your glossary for that, for that unit. Um, you could then assess understanding. One way you could do it is uh, one of the tools that uh, works well in learning media is the quiz maker. And you mm -hmm. could create, um, a quiz, including maybe a short answer question where you ask them, what one question do you still have about unreliable narrators? Um, as a teacher, I always like to do that sort of thing because it really did help assess what they're learning, but what they're also lacking. Um, mm -hmm. And that will help, help direct how you move forward, forward with the material. And then the connection part, I think is so important. I like that. Um, thank you. Um, you. You should. You could have students create maybe a Bitmoji, um, and this is something that I've yet to do <clears throat> because all my colleagues have said how how fun it is and how time consuming it mm -hmm. is. So that's on my list of things to do soon. Um, but maybe they find an unreliable narrator from uh, a piece of literature. Maybe even you let them choose from film or a television show. Um, and then they can do the bitmoji that reveals a lot about their narrator. Like, so if this unreliable narrator did their own bitmoji, <clears throat> what would it look like? <laughs> um, and then you can let them talk about their creations, right? So what can we, your yeah. audience student, the rest of us in class, what can we know about the narrator just from looking at this bitmoji? And what do we still want to know? I and like so that, that, that really, that's, that's cool. That would really assess their understanding too and how they're applying and maybe where they're still stuck with, with the whole unreliable narrator. Excuse me, got a frog throat here. I like that. Oh, thank you. And then also in the English language arts, um, I have a lot of teachers, especially friends of mine who are teachers. They know that I like poetry. I write it, I like to study it. Um, and so they'll ask me, what can I do? It's poetry time <clears throat> every spring usually. And they're not sure either how to teach a, a poetry unit um, or they wanna do something different. So you could do this for uh, poetry analysis, you know, how to talk about poetry. Uh, or you could also use it if you were doing creative writing and you wanted to help your students create poetry. Um, you could do this either way. It would work, it would work either way. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of our really cool collections is Poetry Everywhere. And so let me just play you this, this particular mm -hmm. video. It's uh, a poem from Emily Dickinson, um, very short. I started early, took my dog. I started early, took my dog, and visited the sea. 
the mermaids in the basement came out to look at me. And frigates in the upper floor extended hempen hands, presuming me to be a mouse aground upon the sands. But no man moved me till the tide went past my simple shoe and past my apron and my belt and past my bodice, too, and made as he would eat me up as holy mm -hmm. as a view upon a dandelion sleeve. And then I started, too. And he, he followed, close behind. I felt his silver heel upon my ankle. Then my shoes would overflow with pearl. Until we met the solid town, no man he seemed to know, and bowing with a mighty look at me, the sea withdrew. Okay. I remember reading that in um, college the first time and thinking, what? <laughs> um, but I came to very much appreciate Emily Dickinson. But let me show you what you can do with this wonderful video. I love the video and the artwork. Uh, I'm really drawn to, to, I'm very visual. I love art and photography and, and that, I just think that's wonderfully done. So one, one way we could apply this, um, have students apply what they're learning, and you could do this a lot of different ways, like um, the background reading in, um, in this collection, there are support materials. And for this video, support materials, there's one of the things is the background reading. Um, it talks about how Dickinson is using the ballad form. So you could do a unit, you know, uh, about ballads or different forms of poetry. There's a lot of different ways you could use this resource. Um, but ballads are meant really to be uh, read or sung uh, al aloud. So you could have a student read the poem aloud, or maybe you could have several students read the poem aloud and have everyone make notes. How is hearing the poem different to them than what it was when they read it? first. Um, also, maybe if you do have two or three students read it, everyone's going to read it differently, right? Everybody's going to pause somewhat differently despite the punctuation and stuff that Dickinson uses. You could, you could explore that, um, which I think would be really neat and fun to do. Um, you could do this, I should say, all of these resources, even though they're online, and I know a lot of us, uh, a lot of our schools are doing online learning right now because of the times that, that we're dealing with, they're great for uh, online work, but they're also really helpful uh, for traditional uh, classes as well. But you could use Google Meet, or if you're in person, obviously you could do that easily. And then if you want to assess how a student is learning, depending on what your focus is, you could give them the questions that are provided in the support materials. There are teaching tip in the teaching tips category. Have them complete those and then discuss. And I won't show, I'm not going to show you everything here today, but just be aware that th these resources in the poetry collection, they have a, there are a lot of support materials. They're really good. And then um, I want to move along so I could show you this. Uh, one good way to help them to make connections because I think that's sometimes, as a teacher, what I struggle with. How do I get students to connect and see the importance of something that we're, that we're studying? Um, I like this idea. Choice boards. I'm really, I'm really excited about the choice boards. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is a way for you to differentiate learning and give students um, some independence and some control over how they learn. So you give them options. And so um, there are lots of poems in the Poetry Everywhere collection, and all of the poets read their own work. Um, they don't comment on them, which is cool. I once went to a poetry reading with a poet, and he paused to explain everything to us. It was the most horrible poetry reading I ever went to. 
And it was quite insulting because it was like, we can figure out what your poem is probably about. <laughs> um, but we want the students to do the thinking. So uh, one thing that they could do, they could create three to five original drawings. So maybe you've got some artists in the class. They're going to get excited when they see this option. They can use Google Drawings. I've linked you to some uh, helpful websites that talk about um, how to use that. Um, they can illustrate the poem. So much like we saw the Emily Dickinson poem, even though it was, it was um, video, animated video, they could do drawings and show us. So if they were planning the video, what would the pictures be? Um, you may have some students who want to go ahead and make a video. That would be neat. Um, and they could use Do Ink animation. Um, and I've linked you to a helpful beginner's uh, informational website about Do Ink animation. Um, I know Cynthia does uh, Do Ink green screen and animation workshops in the Media Lab, and, and other education consultants like myself do some of those as well. So just FYI on that. You can have them memorize a poem. There's great value in that. And then make a video uh, of, the, of the student reading the poem or just do an audio and do a dramatic reading. Um, and I've linked you to uh, YouTube, I believe. Christopher Lee, um, he is an actor. He, he's passed in the last few years. He's in everything as the bad guy, okay? He was in Lord of the Rings. If you watch Lord of the Rings, he was, I believe, Saruman. Anyway, he's got a great voice, and he reads Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. So I gave that as an example of a dramatic reading. You could have them do uh, My Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. There's a collection called The Elements of Poetry, or excuse me, a resource called The Elements of Poetry. And I wish I had time. I was going to take you into that, but I think I won't have time to show you that. It's just really phenomenal. It gives a lot of activities for the student to do. So they get to hear Maya Angelou read the poem, which she had a wonderful voice. And then they take you through and have the student do these different activities in the interactive. Um, so you should really, really check that out. It's, it's really, really good. Or you maybe, maybe you want a student who likes, likes to write, maybe wants to do a rap song. Have them write a rap that explains the poem. Um, they can perform it. They can do a, a video if they would prefer. Maybe they're a little shy and don't want to stand up in front of the class or be um, online in front of the class. And let me give you just a quick example. If you're old like me, uh, you may remember this from the 80s, from the Cosby Show. So this is what I remember from the Cosby Show. This one? Oh, sorry for the ads. Okay. <laughs> I say friends. Oh, let me hold your ears. And Romans. Oh, let me hold your ears. I say countrymen. Oh, let me hold your ears. No, I'm Marcus and Toys, but they call me Marcus. I didn't come to fight. See, I came to bark. Bought the holes that the brothers put. And Julius, see, as far as I'm concerned, it was cool with me. You see, Buddhists and the boys must know what they were doing. See, I'm about to run from to ruin because Buddhists in school. Caesar did was to woman out the world and put some bronze in the palm of every boy and girl. But the man so chill that when they handed him the crown, Caesar said, No, baby. And turned the crown down. <laughs> okay. Just a, a little bit of uh, Theo Huxtable and his friend doing a rap of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Just So just give the students an idea of what, what you're asking them to do. So that's one way for them to use technology in different ways and be creative and have a choice in what they're doing with the assignment. Okay. Okay, on to social studies. Um, I found in learning media that um, there's this nice collection called Writing in U.S. History. So obviously you could use this for language arts and writing, but I think it's a really, really well done um, in terms of the history content as well. Um, so. I've linked you to that. And there is a particular interactive resource. So if you wanted to do a unit about the Emancipation Proclamation, um, this would be ideal to introduce that idea. 
No, start with the next, the apply activity before you show the video. So I'm going to go forward here because it says to uh, use the activity in the interactive to help students delve deeper into the content and to think about their own preconceptions about maybe things in history. You know, we've all heard Emancipation Proclamation, but we have certain ideas that may or may not be accurate. And so I have uh, clipped in here one of the activities, which says, write down what you already know about the Emancipation Proclamation and then watch the video. Note any new information you learn about how it came to be issued. So, and then, and then um, after they've uh, thought about and written what they knew, watch, watch the video and it's short. So let me show that to you. By the way, can everybody hear me okay? I've, I'm just not using my headset at all. Yes, Lynn, you sound great. Okay, awesome. I was afraid that you wouldn't be able to hear me. Great, okay. Here's the video. I like the, a complex story. Why was it so significant? There's the portion I borrowed. And then down here is the video. The old textbook view of the Emancipation Proclamation taught that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Now, that great emancipator myth has had a long legacy, but the actual history is far more complicated. Hmm. Consider, for example, the difference in the following two statements. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, like in symbolic exaggerations like this one, or enslaved and free people of color, as they were called at the time, all influenced Lincoln's decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Enslaved and free black people fought the slave system by running away, rebelling, refusing to work, showing up en masse at Union Army camps, demanding to fight the Confederates, put so much pressure on Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Famous abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, they issued eloquent public statements that circled the globe about demanding equality and advocating for immediate abolition. For immediate abolition. Others chose action. Harriet Tubman, pictured right here, most famously escorted people to freedom along the Underground Railroad. But that actually took a whole network of courageous abolitionists to make that system work. People like John Mercer Langston in Ohio, Sarah Parker Riemann, whose whole family was involved in the Underground Railroad. And Civil War had already turned into there, I did it. Great video though, right? <laughs> um, so interesting uh, perspective. I think as a student, I would have had preconceptions about what that was all about. You can assess students as well. Um, there's a lot of questions from the from that interactive as you continue on in the process. Um, and I included one of the questions here. Think about what liberty and freedom meant in the past, what they mean today. What has changed? What has remained the same? And so you can get a sense of how deep, I guess, the student's um, thinking and understanding is going. Maybe what needs to be dealt with more or what, what is already understood well and you can move, move ahead. Um, now, this, this idea, I have to give a shout out to Amy Grant. And I want to say that you need to come and attend uh, Amy session next week, which I will mention again here at the end, but you could um, Amy's idea was to, to use Bitmoji and to create a historical scene. I think that's an awesome idea. So you could have students create a Bitmoji scene um, and um, about the time period um, 1860 to 69 or something, um, have them pick a particular time period in that range. And, and show us a scene and insert them insert themselves or their own bitmoji into the scene. Um, 
maybe they can write about or just discuss during class uh, what they did, what they created, what's happening. Um, and I think that's a really good way to connect with the material, especially historical material. And then on to math, um, I see we only have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead just to kind of give you an overview um, of, what, of, of the different things that you can do. There are a lot of resources uh, for math as well. One of the cool things, if you wanted to talk about probability, you could do the random coin toss. Um, that would be great for middle school or high school. If you wanted to go a little more complex, you could do um, a video in learning media about probability models. So um, have them figure out the probable outcomes of let's say four coin tosses, okay? And you can use the handout that's in the support materials, which I'll show you just really quickly here. And so this is a tree diagram. I vaguely recall something like this from uh, many years ago in school. Um, so this is for two tosses, uh, heads, 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 tails, and so forth. And then you can do three tosses, four tosses. So they can figure that out. Then they can go into the interactive coin toss here. And it tells you that, okay, you're gonna you're gonna do, let's say, four tosses, and you're gonna you're gonna do four, and then it's gonna record in this tree diagram your outcome. Okay, so we click on the coin. I got tails, which is T, tails, heads, H, and heads again, H. So it shows them how to do a tree diagram um, and probability. There are instructions there as well. Okay. There's something like, like that that you can do that's more complex um, for the high schoolers that has to do with the rolling of die or dice uh, that I've linked you to as well. Um, to connect, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. You can also do, there's this really um, neat little video called Your Odds of Winning Powerball, mm. <laughs> uh, which the video was really clever in that it's an animated video and it addresses things I've heard my own family say, and I'm sure I've said as well, which is like, well, you know, nobody's won it in a while, mm. so let's go get a ticket. Um, and it shows the probability of winning the Powerball is even greater than we realize, like it helps you to grasp the concept of the high numbers that are, that are involved. So if you have time, really check that out. Um, there are lots of support materials for that too. And then let me go to the last thing, which is science. So this could be used for science or careers in STEM. Um, this is one of my favorite resources. Note, do the apply activity before you view the videos. So let me click ahead here and then I'll come back. So have students write their own definitions about their ideas of neuroscientists or scientists in general. What do they do? Um, why might they decide to, to go into neuroscience? Um, and how, what is it? Like, it's a study of what? Um, then talk about their ideas. Then look at the two videos. Now I'll show you, does this lady here look familiar to you? Because she should. If you've ever, um, if, you're, if you're old like me and you have seen the show Blossom from the 80s, that is Maya Bialik. She was Blossom. She most recently was Amy on the show Big Bang Theory. And I just, I love that video. Um, also, there's a, another neuroscientist named Crystal Dilworth. And so this series talks to actual uh, people working in STEM. Um, and I think it's interesting to see both of these ladies' perspectives. Let me show you just a little bit of um, Mayim's video. Just a smidge. I have to show a little. Notice there's support materials 
a lot of support materials. Blossom was a pretty bubbly teenager. What? <laughs> I was a more kind of cynical, dark teenager, just because that was my prerogative. People would often say, why are you smiling? Why are you dancing? Well, not a television character. Like most real females, I wasn't one thing. I was a lot of different things. I can also rub my tummy, pat my head, and sing, Bess, you is my woman now at the same time. As a kid, I was fascinated with concepts of science, but never felt I was cut out for it. I thought of science as hard, and I assumed that there was something about me that wasn't made for it. When I was working on Blossom, I had a biology tutor. Her name was Firza, and it was her that showed me that science is for women, science is exciting, you can be as passionate and in love with science as you can be about literature or art. She taught the cell as if it was Picasso's most famous painting, and I began to really actually picture myself as a scientist. <laughs> When Blossom ended, I went. Okay, I wish I could show you the whole thing. She talks mm. about, isn't that awesome? She talks about how um, she went on to school and she has a doctorate in neuroscience. She teaches uh, neuroscience and then she also is an actress and she served as the science consultant on the Big Bang Theory. So, you know, when they had questions about what, how would you store brains in a lab? She told them how to do that um, and other much more complex <laughs> things as well. And then uh, Crystal Deal Dealworth, Dealworth is uh, similar to Maya Bialik in that she um, isn't what a lot of people have in their minds of as a scientist. And I like to show women doing STEM uh, things as well. Um, it, I think it's a good thing to show. I think we, we want to show students um, a variety of kinds of people in different professions. So, so all kinds of students can see themselves. Um, and so that collection by Nova is really, uh, really thorough. So I highly recommend it. Quickly, let me show you. One way you can apply, have students apply what they're learning here, uh, excuse me, assess what, th what they're doing is you could use the tool, the, the quiz maker tool. What did they learn that surprised them, if anything? Um, were their preconceptions correct? Were they off base? Talk about that. But then here's a really neat thing that you could do for to connect to the material. Um, Maya Bialik, she says uh, her teacher showed her the brain as if it were a piece of art, right? You could have students explore the brain. There's an interactive mapping the brain resource. And so have them pick one. Let me show you. And then they can use Google Drawings or they could do their own freehand to create some art based on the type or portion, excuse me, portion of the brain. So there's support materials for this too, but just quickly let me show you how this works. So these are the different areas of the brain and there's one. Clicking along here. So these are the different parts. And then if you want to know what that portion of the brain does, you click the info and it tells you. Okay. So, you know, one has to do like the visual cortex, for example. Obviously, it has to do with vision. And so they could they could get creative and in their artwork somehow reflect to the, the function of that portion of the brain, but try to make it into a piece of art. I mean, if you look at these in a certain way, they almost are anyway, right? Egg-shaped structure, memory, alertness, lots of things that you could do with that. And really, the student would just be limited by their own imagination. So if they can't, like me, can't draw, Maybe they could use photographs or they could find clip art. Um, the way they do it is less important as, than the process, of course. Okay. 
Okay, so that's it. I'm sorry I had to rush through things. I truly did cut this down. <laughs> I had so much more. Um, but there are lots of really great resources and learning media. And I think that framework really helps to take it and see ways that you can use it. If you ever have questions, um, don't hesitate to contact me. My email address is listed. I also have given you a link um, to uh, the folder again here so that you'll have ac easy access to it. And if you want to request resources, you can use this email address, nti at ket.org.